Um, at a climate change uh, meeting recently, um, there was a rather familiar chorus of people talking about the need to project a message of hope to be positive. Actually, I just sat there and kind of thought, uh, here we go again. And uh, now probably I react this way because that's the kind of twisted, cynical bastard I am, actually. But um, <laughs> these were lovely, idealistic, well-meaning people, and obviously they're right, they can hardly be wrong. But why did I feel this impatience with what they were saying? It's because basically I feel like a cornered rat. Why do I feel like a cornered rat? Well, because it's the immensity of what faces us, the shrinking time scale we have to act in. You know, I could go on about tipping points, positive feedbacks, all that sort of thing. It's so very frightening. And it looks like, in many ways, we're losing rather than we're winning, frankly. The political distance we have to travel in such a short time. I feel the truth is we're in a corner and it's going to be desperately hard to find a way out. And, you know, a cornered rat doesn't sit there saying, I must have hope, I must be positive. It scurries about desperately looking for a way out. So often, so often I feel under pressure to tone down what I'm saying. It'll depress people, it'll turn them off, etc. But actually, the immensity of it, the scale of the threat, is not the problem, or not the problem alone. Actually, when people have been faced with a huge overwhelming threats in history, it's very often brought out the best in them. Like the cornered rat, which in the dire extremity of its situation musters, musters the strength for that impossible Herculean leap over a six-foot wall or whatever. Humans are like that. The awareness of dire extremity brings out their strongest response. And the strong response is an understatement for what we need now. So it's, thank you. so it's not just the immensity of the threat, the very real prospect of doom, if you like, that's the problem. It's the remoteness of it, the immensity combined with the remoteness. It's ugly, unpleasant, but at the moment eminently avoidable, forgettable. So people are overwhelmingly tempted to do just that. Uh, but of course, I'm not addressing the question I'm supposed to. Has the government failed us? Well, there's a clear consensus about what we have to do to avoid catastrophic climate change. Reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. Has the government reduced emissions since it came to office? Answer, no. Or barely. And CO2, not at all. So it's failed. Next question. <laughs> well, actually, I think it's failed in another, a deeper way, too. I think the, the, the biggest failure of the government is that his, it has not successfully communicated to the public the true gravity and urgency of the problem. Yes, of course, they've uttered a load of rhetoric about how grave and important it is, but they haven't made it real to people. They haven't made it immediate to people. They have not succeeded in diminishing that sense of its remoteness. And we know that the government is best placed to do this because, for instance... We know what a government can do in wartime when they wage an intensive, relentless campaign to make everyone aware of the threat, when they galvanise the whole of society behind one common aim. They haven't done that. They don't want to be the messenger that carries what is unalloyedly bad news, quite frankly, because they're afraid that in, ele in electoral terms, they'll be shot. Of course, the failure to convey a sense of the immediacy of the problem is closely bound up with a failure to introduce realistic measures to deal with it, to show that they're serious. Where's the carbon rationing or the ecological tax regime or whatever? Worse, far worse, we're seeing plans for new runways and airport expansion, for more biofuels despite the overwhelming evidence that they make climate change worse, and for the first new coal-fired power stations in 30 years, a huge leap backwards instead of the huge leap forwards that we need. Yes, we had the climate bill, and that's a tremendous victory. But the thing on paper is the easy part. In a sense, it's just printed rather than verbal rhetoric. There is still a huge battle to be fought to ensure the targets are actually reached, 
probably actually battle after battle. And beyond that, there's every likelihood that the targets will not be adequate. The science is not certain, it's constantly changing, and the direction it's changing in is not the direction we'd like it to. But part of the reason why the government is able to perform so badly is that huge sense of remoteness, of unreality around the issue of climate change. And a lot of things contribute to that. Presenting the issue in a way that suggests that our individual efforts alone can solve the problem is one of them. Of course, the government loves that because that way it's not their fault. It's ours and ours alone. I could go on further about that, but on this occasion, I'll go on with some other things. But also every time we frame or adapt our message about climate change in a way to suit the receiver rather than simply to express its reality, the reality of the phenomenon and what it implies. Every time we cushion the blow or sugar the pill, we exacerbate that sense of unreality. And I think every time those two clever people in NGOs think they have some brilliant new way to put over the message, they don't. There is no clever, brilliant way of putting it across. There's only the truth. And if the truth is scary and grim, then it is what it is. But not only that, if we're telling people that this is a global emergency, the greatest emergency ever, then we need to speak and act like it's a global emergency. It's worth thinking, actually, how many NGOs really do that, really direct all their energies to it the way you would to something that was the greatest global emergency ever. I could certainly wish that more of them directed more energy to mobilizing people to show visible on the streets concern, like, for instance, our march on December the 6th, which will be, after all, the year's biggest such mobilization in the UK. They'll say, oh, they're going to do that next year. But everything about climate change is happening too late, and we need to pull out all the stops now. We need to pull out all the stops just to look to other people like we're pulling out all the stops we need to act like it's desperate because it is desperate. The real point is we need to dispel that sense of remoteness, of unreality. And we need to do that by considering not only the rational contents of, of what we say, but the emotional impact of what we say and do. If reason alone was good enough, we would have long won a long time ago. We need to communicate on an emotional level. Personally, actually, I want to scream most of the time. Have you seen the notice for this climate safety talk thing that's going to be here on the 27th with, with George Monbiot? May his name be Mud because he's dropped us in it by not turning up today. Um, it says, no screaming, no panic, no gloom, no doom. Basically, what they're going to do is tell us it's much worse than even what we thought it was. And then they're going to propose a solution that's going to be fantastically hard to achieve politically within what they're going to tell us is the vanishingly tiny amount of time we've got left to do it. And they're telling us not to panic. Who the hell do they think they are? I'm going to come here and I'm going to scream. <laughs>